Renyard the Fox. Part 1 by John Maysfield The Meat Was It, The Cock and Pie by Charles and Martha Enderby. The Grey, 300-year-old in long since the haunt of Benjamin the Highwayman, who rode the bay. The tavern fronts the coaching way, the male changed horses there of old. It has a strip of grassy mole in front of it, a broad green strip. A trough, where horses, muzzles dip, stands opposite the tavern front, and there that morning came the hunt, to fill that quiet width of road is full of men as frameload, is full of sea when tide is in. The stables were alive with din from dawn until the time of meeting. A pad groom gave a cloth a beating, knocking the dust out with a stake. Two men cleaned stalls with fork and rake, and one went. Whistling to the pump, the handle whined, cur lump, cur lump. I the water splashed into the pail, and, as he went, it left a trail, lipped over on the yard's bricked paving. Two grooms, sent on before, were shaving there in the yard, at glasses propped on jutting bricks. They scraped and stropped, and felt their chins and leaned and peered. A woodland day was what they feared, as second horsemen, shaving there. Then, in the stalls where hunters were, straw rustled as the horses shifted, the hayseeds ticked and haystraws drifted from racks as horses tugged their feed. Slow gulping sounds of steady greed came from each stall, and sometimes stampings, whinnies, at well-known steps, and rampings, to see the horse in the next stall. Outside, the spangled cock did call to scattering grain that Martha flung and many a time a mop was rung by Susan ere the floor was clean. The harness room, that busy scene, clinked and chinked from ostlers brightening rings and bits with dips of whitening, rubbing fox flecks out of stirrups, dumbing buckles of their chirrups by the touch of oily feathers. Some, with stag's bones, rubbed at leathers, brushed at saddle flaps or hove saddle linings to the stove. Blue smoke from strong tobacco drifted out of the yard, the passers sniffed it, mixed with the strong ammonia flavor of horses' stables and the savor of saddle paste and polish spirit which put the gleam on flap and tear it. The grooms in shirts with rolled up sleeves, belted by girths of colored weaves, groomed the clipped hunters in their stalls. One said, My dad cured saddle galls, he called it Dr. Barton's cure hogs lard and borax, laid on pure. And others said, J. Back. My son, stand over, girl. Now, girl, ha, done. Now, boy, no snapping. Gently. Crikes, he gives a rare pinch when he likes. Drawn blood? I thought he looked a biter. I give him all. Sweet spit of nitre for that, myself. That sometimes cures. Now, beauty, mind them feet of yours. They groomed, and sist with hissing notes to keep the dust out of their throats. There came again and yet again the feed box lid, the swish of grain, or Joe's boots stamping in the loft, the hay fork's stab and then the soft hay scratching slither down the chute. Then, with a thud some horse's foot stamped, and the gulping munch again resumed its lippings at the grain. The road outside the inn was quiet save for the poor, mad, restless Piat hopping his hanging wicker cage. No comative of sleep or sage will cure the fever to be free. He shook the wicker ceaselessly now up, now down, but never out, on wind waves, being blown. About, looking for dead things good to eat. His cage was strewn with scattered wheat. At ten o'clock, the doctor's lad brought up his master's hunting pad and put him in a stall, and leaned against the stall, and sist, and cleaned the port and cannons of his curb. He chewed a sprig of smelling herb. He sometimes stopped, and spat, and chid the silly things his master did. At twenty past, old Baldick strode his plowman's straddle down the road. An old man with a gaunt, burnt face, his eyes wrapped back on some far place like some starved, half-mad saint in bliss in God's world through the rags of this. He leaned upon a stake of ash cut from a sapling. Many a gash was in his old, full-skirted coat. The twisted muscles in his throat moved, as he swallowed, like taut cord. His oaken face was seamed and gored. He halted by the inn and stared on that far bliss, that place prepared, beyond his eyes, beyond his mind. 
Then Thomas Cop, of Cowfoot's Wind, drove up, and stopped to take a glass. I hope they'll gallop on my grass, he said. My little girl does sing to see the red coats galloping. It's good for grass, too. To be trodden except they poach it, where it's sodden. Then Billy Waldrist, from the Lynn, with Jockey Hill, from Pitts, came in and had a sip of gin and stout to help the jockey's sweatings out. Rare day for scent, the jockey said. A pony like a feather bed on four short sticks, took place aside. The little girl who rode astride watched everything with eyes that glowed with glory in the horse she rode. At half past ten some lads on foot came to be beaters to a shoot of rabbits on the Warren Hill. Rough sticks they had, and Hob and Jill, their ferrets, in a bag, and netting. They talked of dinner beer and bedding, and jeered at those who stood around. They rolled their dogs upon the ground, and teased them. Rats, they cried, go. Fetch, go seek, good roxer. Zebite, good betch. What dinner beer, ll they give us, lad. Sex courts the lot last year we had. They'd ought to give us seven this. Seek, Susan. What a betch it is. A palmly cob came trotting up. Round-bellied like a drinking cup. Bearing on back a palmly man. Round-bellied like a drinking can. The clergyman from Condicote. His face was. Scarlet from his trot. His white hair bobbed about his head as halos do round clergy dead. He asked Tom Cop. How long to wait? His loose mouth opened like a gate. To pass the wagons of his speech. He had a mighty voice to preach, though indolent in other matters. He let his children go in tatters. His daughter Madge on foot, flush-cheeked, in broken hat and boots that leaked, with bits of hay all over her, her plain face grinning at the stir. A broad pale face, snub-nosed, with speckles of sandy eyebrows sprinkled with freckles, came after him and stood apart beside the darling of her heart, Miss Hattie Dice from Baden-Dean a big young fair one, chiseled clean brow, chin and nose, with great blue eyes all innocence and sweet. Surprise, and golden hair piled coil on coil, too beautiful for time to spoil. They talked in undertones together, not of the hunting, nor the weather. Old Stephen from Scratch Stephen Place, a white beard and a rosy face, came next on his stringhill tea gray. I've come to see the hounds away, he said and ride a field or two. We old have better things to do than breaking all. Our necks for fun. He shone on people like the sun, and on himself for shining so. Three men came riding in a row. John Pym, a bull man, quick to strike. Gross and blunt headed like a shrike. Yet sweet voiced as a piping flute. Tom C., the trainer, from the toot, red, with an angry, puzzled face and mouth twitched upward out of place sucking cheap grapes and spitting seeds, and stone, of Bartle's cattle feeds, a man whose bulk of flesh and bone made people call him twenty stone. He was the man who stood a pull at Tencombe with the Jersey bull, and brought the bull back to his stall. Some children ranged the tavern wall, sucking their thumbs and staring hard. Some grooms brought horses from the yard. Jane Selby said to Ellen, Tranter, a lot on em come doggin, and her? A lot on em, said Ellen. Look, they're Mr. Gaunt of Water's Hook. They say he, whispered. La, said Jane. Gaunt flung his heel across the mane, and slithered from his horse and stamped. Boots tight, he said. My, feet are cramped. A loose shod horse came clicking clack. Nick Wolvesy on a hired hack came titip, like. A cup and ball. One saw the sun, moon, stars, and all the great green earth twixt him and saddle. Then Molly Wolvesy riding straddle, red as a rose with eyes like sparks. Two boys from college out for larks hunted bright Molly for a smile, but were not worth their quarries while. Two eyeglassed gunners dressed in tweed came with a spaniel on a lead and waited for a fellow gunner. The parson's son, the famous runner, came dressed to follow hounds on foot. His knees were red as yew tree root from being bare, day in, day out. He wore a blazer, and a clout, his sweater's arms, tied round his neck. His football shorts had many a speck and splash of mud from many a fall got as he picked the slippery ball heeled out behind a breaking scrum. He grinned at people, 
but was dumb, not like these lousy foreigners. The otter hounds and harriers from Godstow to the Y all knew him. And with him came the stock which grew him, the parson and his sporting wife. She was a stout one, full of life, with red, quick, kindly, manly face. She held the knave, queen, king and ace, in every hand she played with men. She was no, sister to the hen, but fierce and minded to be queen. She wore a coat and skirt of green, a waistcoat cut of hunting red, her tea-a-pin was a fox's head. The parson was a manly one, his jolly eyes were bright with fun. His jolly mouth was well inclined to cry aloud his jolly mind to everyone, in jolly terms. He did not talk of churchyard worms, but of our privilege as dust to box a lively bout with lust air going to heaven to rejoice. He loved the sound of his own voice, his talk was like a charge of horse, his build was all compact, for force, well knit, well made, well colored, eager. He kept no lent to make him meager, he loved his God, himself and man, he never said, life's wretched span, this wicked world, in any sermon. This body that we, feed the worm on, to him, was jovial stuff that thrilled. He liked to see the foxes killed, but most he felt himself in clover to hear, hen left, hair right, cock over, at woodside, when the leaves are brown. Some grey cathedral in a town where drowsy bells toll out the time to shaven closes sweet with lime, and wallflower roots rive out the mortar all summer on the Norman. Dortar was certain some day to be his, nor would a mitre go amiss to him, because he governed well. His voice was like the tenor bell when services were said and sung. And he had read in many a tongue, Arabic, Hebrew, Spanish, Greek. Two bright young women, nothing meek, rode up on bicycles and propped their wheels in such wise that they dropped to bring the parson's son. To aid, their cycling suits were tailor-made, smart, mannish, pert, but feminine. The color and the zest of wine were in their presence in their bearing. Like spring, they brought the thought of pairing. The parson's lady thought them pert, and they could mock a man and flirt do billiard tricks with corks and pennies, sing ragtime songs and win at tennis the silver. Cigarette case prize. They had good color and bright eyes, bright hair, bright teeth and pretty skin, which many lads had longed to win on darkened stairways after dances. Their reading was the last romances, and they were dashing hockey players. Men called them, Jill and Joan, the slayers. They were as bright as fresh sweet peas. Old Farmer Bennett followed these upon his big-boned savage black, whose mule teeth yellowed to bite back whatever came within his reach. Old Bennett sat him like a leech, the grim old rider seemed to be as hard about the mouth as he. The beaters nudged each other's ribs. With, there he goes, his bloody nibs. He come on Joe and Auntie Cop, and beat em with his hunting crop like though. They'd been a sack of beans. His. Pickers were a pack of queens, and Joe and Auntie took a couple. He caught em there, and banged em supple. Women and men, he didn't care. He'd kill em some day, if he dare. He beat the whole four nearly dead. I'll learn, ee -e rabbit in my shed. That's how my ricks get set afire. That's what he said, the bloody liar. Old oaf. I'd like to burn his ricks. Th, old swines too. Free with fists and sticks. He keeps that Mrs. Jones himself, just like an axe head on its helve old Bennett sat and watched the gathering. He'd given many a man a lathering in field or barn, and women too. His cold eye reached the women through with comment, and the men with scorn. He hated women gently born, he hated all beyond his grasp, for he was minded like the asp, that strikes whatever is not dust. Charles Copps, of Copps Hold Manor thrust next into view. In face and limb the beauty and the grace of him were like the golden age returned. His grave eyes steadily discerned the good in men and what was wise. He had deep blue, mild-colored eyes and shocks of harvest-colored hair still beautiful with youth. An air or power of kindness went about him. No heart of youth could ever doubt him or fail to follow where he led. He was a genius, simply bred and quite unconscious of his power. 
he was the very red rose flower of all that colored countryside. Gauchos had taught him how to ride. He knew all arts, but practiced most the art of bettering flesh and ghost in men and lads down in the mud. He knew no class in flesh and blood. He loved his kind. He spent some pith, long since, relieving Ladysmith. Many a horse he trotted tame heading commandos from their aim in those old days upon the veldt. An old bear in a scarlet pelt came next. Old Squire Haradu. His eyebrows gave a man the grue. So bushy and so fierce they were. He had a bitter tongue to swear. A fierce, hot, hard, old, stupid squire, with all his liver made of fire, small brain, great courage, mulish will. The hearts in all his house stood still when someone crossed the squire's path. For he was terrible in wrath, and smashed whatever came to hand. Two things he failed to understand, the foreigner and what was new. His daughters, Carrie, Jane and Lou, rode with him, Carrie at his side. His son, the ne'er-do-well, had died in Arizona long before. The squire set the greatest store by Carrie, youngest of the three, and lovely to the blood was she. Blonde, with a face of blush and cream, and eyes deep violet in their gleam, bright blue when quiet in repose. She was a very golden rose, and many a man when sunset came would see the manor windows. Flame, and think, my beauty's home is there. Queen Helen had less golden hair, Queen Cleopatra paler lips. Queen Blanche's eyes were in eclipse by golden carries glancing by. She had a wit for mockery and sang mild, pretty, senseless songs of sunsets, heaven and lovers' wrongs, sweet to the squire when he had dined. A rosebud need not have a mind. A lily is not sweet from learning. Jane looked like a dark lantern, burning, outwardly dark, unkempt, uncouth, but minded like the living truth a friend that nothing shook nor wearied. She was not, darling jane nor, dearied. She was all prickles to the touch, so sharp that many feared to clutch, so keen that many thought her bitter, she let the little sparrows twitter. She had a hard, ungracious way, her storm of hair was iron gray, and she was passionate in her heart for women's souls that burn apart, just as her mother's had, with squire. She gave the sense of smoldering fire. She was not happy being a maid, at home, with squire, but she stayed, enduring life, however bleak, to guard her sisters, who were weak, and force a life for them from squire. And she had roused and stood his fire a hundred times, and earned his hate, to win those two a better state. Long years before the canon's son had cared for her, but he had gone to Klondike, to the mines, for gold. To find, in some strange way untold, a foreign grave that no men knew. No depth, nor beauty, was in Lou, but charm and fun, for she was merry, round, sweet and little, like a cherry, with laughter like a robin singing. She was not kitten-like and clinging, but pert and arch and fond of flirting, in mocking ways that were not hurting, and merry ways that women pardoned. Not being married yet she gardened. She loved sweet music. She would sing songs made before the German king made England German in her mind. She sang, My lady is unkind, the hunt is up, and those, sweet things which Thomas Campion set to strings, thrice toss, and, what, and, where are now? The next to come was Major Howe driven in a dogcart by a groom. The testy major was in fume to find no hunter standing waiting. The groom who drove him caught a rating. The groom who had the horse in stable was damned in half the tongues. Of Babel, the major being hot and heady when horse or dinner was not ready. He was a lean, tough, liverish fellow, with pale blue eyes, the whites pale yellow, mustache clipped toothbrush wise, and jaws shaved bluish like old partridge claws. When he had stripped his coat he made a speckless presence for parade, new pink, white cords, and glossy tops new gloves, the newest thing in crops, worn with an air that well expressed his sense that no one else was dressed. Quick trotting after Major Howe came Dr. Frome of Quickhamshow, a smiling silent man whose brain knew all of every secret pain in every man and woman there. Their inmost lives were all laid bare to him, 
because he touched their lives when strong emotions sharp as knives brought out what sort of soul each was. As secret as the graveyard grass he was, as he had need to be. At some time he had had to see each person there, sans clothes, sans mask, sans lying even, when to ask probed a tamed spirit into truth. Richard, his son, a jolly youth, rode with him, fresh from Thomas's, as merry as a yearling is in May time in a clover patch. He was a gallant, chick to hatch, big, brown and smiling, blithe and kind, with all his father's love of mind and greater force to give it act. To see him when the scrum was packed, heave, playing forward, was a sight. His tackling was the crowd's delight in many a danger close to goal. The pride in the three-quarters soul dropped, like a wet rag, when he collared. He was as steady as a bollard, and gallant as a skysail yard. He rode a chestnut mare which sparred. In good St. Thomas's Hospital he was the crown imperial of all the scholars of his year. The Herald lads, from Tencombe Weir, came all on foot in corduroys, poor widowed Mrs. Harold's boys, Dick, Hal and Charles, whose father died. Will Macemore shot him in the side by accident at Macemore Farm. A hazel knocked Will Macemore's arm in getting through a hedge. His gun was not half cocked, so it was done and those three boys left fatherless. Their gaitered legs were in a mess with good red mud from twenty ditches, Hal's face was plastered like his, breeches, Dick chewed a twig of juniper. They kept at distance from the stir, their loss had made them lads apart. Next, came the Colway's pony cart from Colne Street Evelyn's with the party. Hugh Colway, jovial, bold and hearty, and Polly Colway's brother, John, their horses had been both sent on, and Polly Colway drove them there. Poor pretty Polly Colway's hair. The grey mare killed her at the brook down Seven Springs Mead at Waterhook just one month later, poor sweet woman. Her brother was a rat-faced Roman, lean, puckered, tight-skinned from the sea, commander in the Conachi, able to drive a horse or ship, or crew of men without a whip by wool, as long as they could go. His face would wrinkle, row on row, from mouth to hair roots when he laughed. He looked ahead as though his craft were with him still, in dangerous channels. He and Hugh Colway tossed their flannels into the pony cart and mounted. Six foiled attempts the watchers counted, the horses being bickering things that so much scarlet made like kings, such sidling and such pawing and shifting. When Hugh was up his mare went drifting sidelong and feeling with her heels for horse's legs and poche wheels, while lather creamed her neat clipped skin. Hugh guessed her foibles. With a grin, he was a rich town merchant's son, a wise and kind man, fond of fun, who loved to have a troop of friends at Coin St. Eve's for all weekends, and troops of children in for tea. He gloried in a Christmas tree, and Polly was his heart's best treasure and Polly was a golden pleasure, to everyone, to see or hear. Poor Polly's dying struck him queer, he was a darkened man thereafter, cowed, silent, he would wince at laughter and be so gentle it was strange even to see. Life loves to change, now Colne Street Evelyn's hearths are cold, the shutters up, the hunters sold, and green mold damps the locked front door. But this was still a month before, and Polly, golden in the chaise, still smiled, and there were golden days, still thirty days, for those dear lovers. The riddens came, from ockle covers, Bill ridden riding storm along, by tempest out of love me long. A proper handful of a horse that nothing but the aintry course could bring to terms, save Bill perhaps. All sport, from bloody war to scraps, came well to Bill, that big-mouthed smiler. They nicknamed him, the Mug Beguiler, for Billy lived too. Much with horses, in Coper's yards and Sharper's courses, to lack the sharper Coper streak. He did not turn the other cheek when struck, as English Christians do. He boxed like a Whitechapel Jew, and many a time his knuckles bled against a racecourse gypsy's head. For, hit him first and argue later, was truth at Billy's alma mater, not love, not any bosh of love. His hand was like a chamois glove, and riding was his chief delight. 
he bred the chaser Chinese white from lilybud by mandarin, and when his mouth tucked corners in, and scent was high and hounds were going, he went across a field like snowing and tackled anything that came. His wife, Sal Ridden, was the same, a loud, bold, blonde, abundant mare with white horse teeth and stooks of hair, like polished brass, and such a manner it flaunted from her like a banner. Her father was torn see the trainer. She rode a lovely earth disdainer which she and Billy wished to sell. Behind them rode her daughter Belle, a strange, shy, lovely girl, whose face was sweet with thought and proud with race, and bright with joy at riding there. She was as good as blowing air, but shy and difficult to know. The kittens in the barley mow, the setter's toothless puppies sprawling, the blackbird in the apple calling, all knew her spirit more than we. So delicate these maidens be in loving lovely helpless things. The manor set, from ten comb rings, came with two friends, a set of six. Ed Manor with his cockerel chicks, Knob, Cobb and Bunny, as they called them. God help the school or rule which galled them. They carried head, and friends from town. Ed Manor trained on Tencombe down. He once had been a famous bat. He had that stroke, the Manor pat, which snicked the ball for three, past cover. He once scored twenty in an over, but now he cricketed no more. He purpled in the face and swore at all three sons, and trained, and told long tales of cricketing of old when he alone had saved his side. Drink made it doubtful if he lied. Drink purpled him, he could not face the fences now, nor go the pace, he brought his friends to meet, no more. His big son Nob, at whom he swore, swore back at him, for Nob was surly, tall, shifty, sullen smiling, burly, quite fearless, built with such a jaw that no man's rule could be his law nor any woman's son his master. Boxing he relished, he could plaster all those who boxed out Tencombe way. A front tooth had been knocked away two days before, which put his mouth a little to the east of south, and put a venom in his laughter. Cobb was a lighter lad, but dafter, just past eighteen, while Nob was twenty. Nob had no nerves but Cobb had plenty, so Cobby went where Nobby led. He had no brains inside his head, was fearless, just like Nob but put some clog of folly round his foot, where Nob put wool of force or fraud. He spat aside and muttered God when vexed. He took to whiskey kindly and loved and followed Nobby blindly, and rode as in the saddle born. Bon looked upon the two with scorn. He was the youngest, and was wise. He too was fair, with sullen eyes. He too, a year before, had had a zest for going to the bad, with Cobb and Nob. He knew the joys of drinking with the stable boys, or smoking while he filled his skin with pints of Guinness dashed with gin and Cobby yelled a body ditty, or cutting Nobby for the kitty, and damning people's eyes and guts, or drawing evening church for sluts. He knew them all and now was quit. Sweet Polly Callway managed it and Bunny changed. He dropped his drink, the pleasant pit's seductive brink. He started working in the stable, and well, for he was shrewd and able. He left the doubtful female friends picked up at evening service ends, he gave up cards and swore no more. Nob called him, the reforming whore, the soul's awakening, or, the text, Nob being always coarse when vexed. Ed Manor's friends were Hawk and Slad, old college friends, the last he had, rare horsemen, but their nerves were shaken by all the whiskey they had taken. Hawk's hand was trembling on his rein. His eyes were dead blue like a vein. His peaked, sad face was touched with breeding. His querulous mind was quaint from reading. His piping voice still quirked with fun. Many a mad thing he had done, riding to hounds and going to races. A glimmer of the gambler's graces, wit, courage, devil, touched his talk. Slad's big fat face was white as chalk. His mind went wandering, swift yet solemn, twixt winning post and betting column, the weights and forms and likely colts, he said, this road is full of jolts, I shall be seasick riding here, oh, damn last night with that liqueur, Len Stokes rode up on Peterkin, he owned the downs by Baden Wynn, and grazed some thousand sheep, 
the boy grinned round at men with jolly joy at being alive and being there. His big round face and mop of hair shone, his great teeth shone in his grin. The clean blood in his clear tan skin ran merry, and his great voice mocked his young friends present till they rocked. Steer Harpit came from Rowell Hill, a small, frail man, all heart and will, a sailor, as his voice betrayed. He let his whip thong droop and played it snicking off the grass blades with it. John Hankerton, from Compton Lythet, was there with pity. Hankerton, and Mike, their good for little son, back, smiling, from his seventh job. Joan Urch was there upon her cob, Tom Sparsholt on his lanky gray, John Restrop from Hope Gonaway, and Vaughn, the big black handsome devil, loose-lipped with song and wine and revel, all rosy from his morning tub. The gods down tigress with her cub, Lady and Tommy Crow Marsh, came. The great eyes smoldered in the dame, wit glittered, too, which few men saw. There was more beauty there than claw. Tommy in bearing, horse and dress, was black, fastidious handsomeness, choice to his trimmed soul's fingertips, Heredia's sonnets on his lips. A line undrawn, a plate not bitten, a stone uncut, a phrase unwritten that would be perfect, made his mind. A choice pull, from a rare print, signed, was Tommy. He collected plate, old Sheffield, and he owned each state of all the Marion Paris etchings. Colonel Sir Button Bud of Fletchings was there. Long Robert Thrupp was there. Three yards of him men said there were. Long as the king of Prussia's fancy. He rode the long-legged necromancy, a useless racehorse that could canter. George Childry, with his jolly banter was there. Nick Childry, too, come down the night before from London town to hunt and have his lungs blown. Clean. The Ilsley set from Tuttock's Green was there. Old Henry Ilsley drove. Carlotta Ilsley brought her love, a flop-jowled broker from the city. Men pitied her, for she was pretty. Asterisk some grooms and second horsemen mustered. A lot of men on. Foot were clustered round the inn door all busy drinking. One heard the kissing glasses clinking in passage as the tray was brought. Two terriers, which they had there, fought there on the green, a loud, wild whirl. Bell stopped them like a gallant girl. The hens behind the tavern clucked. Then on a horse which bit and bucked, the half-broke four-year-old marauder, came. Minton Price of T.H., Afghan border, lean, puckered, yellowed, knotted, scarred, tough as a hide rope twisted hard, tense tiger sinew knit to bone. Strange weighed from having lived alone with Kaffir, Afghan and Belush, in stations frozen in the couche where nothing but the bullet sings. His mind had conquered many things painting, mechanics, physics, law. White hot, hand beaten. Things to draw self-hammered from his own soul's stithy. His speech was blacksmith sparked and pithy. Danger had been his brother bred. The stones had often been his bed in bickers with the border thieves. A chestnut mare with swerves and heaves came plunging, scattering all the crowd. She tossed her head and laughed aloud and bickered sideways past the meat. From pricking, ears to mincing feet she was all tense with blood and quiver. You saw her clipped hide twitch and shiver over her netted cords of veins. She carried Cottle, of the slines, a tall, black, bright-eyed, handsome lad. Great power and great grace he had. Men hoped the greatest things of him. His grace made people think him slim but he was muscled like a horse, a sculptor would have. Wrought his torse in bronze or marble for Apollo. He loved to hurry like a swallow for miles on miles of short grassed sweet, blue, hair-belled downs where dewy feet of pure winds hurry ceaselessly. He loved the downland like a sea. The downland where the kestrels hover the downland had him for a lover. And every other thing he loved in which a clean free spirit moved. So beautiful he was. So bright, he looked to men like young delight gone courting April maidenhood, that has the primrose in her blood, he on his mincing lady mare. Och Gurney and old Pete were there riding their bonny cobs and swearing. Och's wife had given them both a fairing, a horse rosette, red, white and blue. Their cheeks were brown as any brew, and every comer to the meat said, 
Hello. Ock, or. Morning. Pete. Be you a going to a wedding? Why, Noah, they said. We'm going a betting. Now bent us, uncle, bent us, ock? Pete Gurney was a lusty cock turned sixty-three, but bright and hale, a dairy farmer in the vale. Much like a robin in the face, much character in little space, with little eyes like burning coal. His mouth was like a slit or hole in leather that was seamed and lined. He had the russet apple mind that betters as the weather worsen. He was a manly English person, kind to the core, brave, merry, true. One grief he had, a grief still new, that former parson joined with squire in putting down the playing choir in church, and putting organ in. Ah, boys, that was a pious din, that choir was, a pious praise the noise was that we used to raise, I and my serpent, George with his in, on Easter day in, he is risen, or blessed Christmas in, Venite. And how the trombone came in mighty in alleluias from the heart. Pious, for each man played his part, not like tis now. Thus he, still sore for changes forty years before when all, that could, in time and tune blew. Trumpets to the new moon. He was a bachelor from choice. He and his nephew farmed the boys, prime pasture land for thirty cows. Ock's wife, Selina Jane, kept house, and jolly were the three together. Ock had a face like summer weather. A broad red sun, split by a smile. He mopped his forehead all the while and said, by damn, and, Ben, Tias, unk? His eyes were close and, deeply sunk, he cursed his hunter like a lover. Now blast your soul, my dear, give over. Whoa, now, my pretty, damn your eyes. Like Pete, he was of middle size, Dean Oak-like, stuggy, strong in shoulder. He stood a wrestle like a boulder. He had a back for pitching hay. His singing voice was like a bay. In talk he had a sideways spit, each minute to refresh his wit. He cracked Brazil nuts with his teeth. He challenged Cobbett of the Heath, weightlifting champion, once, but lost. Hunting was what he loved the most next to his wife and Uncle Pete. With beer to drink and cheese to eat and rain in May to fill the grasses, this life was not a dream that passes to Ock, but like the summer flower. But now the clock had struck the hour, and round. The corner down the road the bob-bob-bobbing serpent flowed with three black knobs upon its spine, three bobbing black caps in a line. A glimpse of scarlet at the gap showed underneath each bobbing cap, and at the corner by the gate one heard Tom Dancy give a rate. Hep, drop it, jumper. Have a care. There came a growl, half rate, half swear, a spitting crack, a tuneful. Whimper and sweet religion entered jumper. There was a general turn of faces, the men and horses shifted places, and round the corner came the hunt, those feathery things, the hounds, in front. Intent, wise, dipping, trotting, straying, smiling at people, shoving, playing, nosing to children's faces, waving their feathery sterns, and all behaving, one eye to dancy on maroon. Their padding cat feet beat a tune, and though, they trotted up so quiet their noses brought them news of riot, wild smells of things with living blood, hot smells, against the grippers good, of weasel, rabbit, cat and hare, whose feet had been before them there, whose taint still tingled every breath, but dancy on maroon was death, so, though their noses roved, their feet larked and trit trotted to the meat, Bill Tall and L and Murdy Key, aged fourteen years between the three, were flooded by them at the bend, they thought their little lives would end. The grave, sweet eyes looked into theirs, cold noses came, and clean short hairs, and tails all crumpled up like ferns, a sea of moving heads and sterns, all round them, brushing coat. And dress, one paused, expecting a caress. The children shrank into each other, shut eyes, clutched tight, and shouted, Mother! With mouths wide open, catching tears. Sharp misses tall allayed their fears. Air out the road, the dogs won't hurt, ee. There now, you've cried your faces dirty. More cleaning up for me to do. What, cry at dogs, great lumps like you? She licked, her handkerchief and smeared their faces where the dirt appeared. 
The hunt trick trotted to the meeting. Tom Dancy touching cap to greeting. Slow lifting crop thong to the rim. No hunter there got more from him except some brightening of the eye. He halted at the cock and pie. The hounds drew round him on the green, arrogant, daffodil and queen closest, but all in little space. Some lolled their tongues. Some made grimace, yawning, or tilting nose in quest. All stood and looked about with zest. They were uneasy as they waited. Their sires and dams had been well mated. They were a lovely pack for looks. Their forelegs drums ticked without crooks, straight, without overtread or bend, muscled to gallop to the end, with neat feet round as any. Cats, great chested, muscled in the slats, bright, clean, short coated, broad in shoulder, with stag like eyes that seemed to smolder. The heads well cocked, the clean necks strong, brows broad, ears close, the muzzles long, and all like racers in the thighs, their noses exquisitely wise, their minds being memories of smells, their voices like a ring of bells, their sterns. All spirit, cock and feather, their colors like the English weather, magpie and hare, and badger pie, like minglings in a double dye, some smutty nosed, some tan, none bald. Their manners were to come when called, their flesh was sinew knit to bone, their courage like a banner blown. Their joy to push him out of cover, and hunt him till they rolled him over. They were as game, as Robert Dover. Tom Dancy was a famous whip, trained as a child in horsemanship, entered, as soon as he was able, as boy at Conter's racing stable. There, like the other boys, he slept in stall beside the horse he kept, snug in the straw, and Conter's stick brought morning to him all too quick. He learned the high, quick gingery ways of thoroughbreds his stable. Days made him a rider, groom and vet. He promised to be too thick set for jockeying, so left it soon. Now he was whip and rode maroon. He was a small, lean, wiry man, with sunk cheeks weathered to a tan scarred by the spikes of hawthorn sprays dashed throw, head down, on going days, in haste to see the line they took. There was a beauty in his look, it was intent. His speech, was plain. Maroon's head, reaching to the rein, had half his thought before he spoke. His, gone away, when foxes broke was like a bell. His chief delight was hunting fox from noon to night. His pleasure lay in hounds and horses. He loved the seven springs watercourses, those flashing brooks, in good sound grass, where scent would hang like breath on glass. He loved the, English countryside. The wine-leaved bramble in the ride the lichen on the apple trees, the poultry ranging on the leas, the farms, the moist earth-smelling cover, his wife's green grave at Mitcheldover, where snowdrops pushed at the first thaw. Under his hide his heart was raw with joy and pity of these things. The second whip was Kitty Mings, still but a lad but keen in. Quick, son of old Mings, who farmed the wick, a horse-mouthed lad who knew his work. He rode the big black horse, the Turk, and longed to be a huntsman bold. He had the horse look, sharp and old, with much good nature in his face. His passion was to go the pace, his blood was crying for a taming. He was the devil's chick for gaming, he was a rare good lad to box. He sometimes had a mane of cocks down at the flags. His job with hounds at present kept his blood in bounds from rioting and running hare. Tom Dancy made him have a care. He worshipped Dancy heart and soul. To be a huntsman was his goal. To be with hounds, to charge full tilt blackthorns that made the gentry wilt was his ambition and his hope. He was a hot colt needing rope. He was too quick to speak his passion to suit his present huntsman's fashion. The huntsman, Robin Daw, looked round. He sometimes called a favorite hound gently to see the creature turn look happy up and wag his stern. He smiled and nodded and saluted to those who hailed him, as it suited, and patted Pips, his hunter's neck. His new pink was without a speck. He was a red-faced smiling fellow, his voice clear tenor, full and mellow, his eyes, all fire, were black and small. He had been smashed in many a fall. His eyebrow had a white curved mark left by the bright shoe of the lark down in a ditch by seven springs. 
His coat had all been trod to strings. His ribs laid bare and shoulder broken. Being jumped on down at water's oaken the time his horse came down and rolled. His face was of the country mold such as the mason sometimes cut it on English molding ends which jutted out of the church walls, centuries since. And as you never know the quince, how good he is, until you try. So, in Daw's face, what met the eye was only part. What lay behind was English character and mind, great kindness, delicate. Sweet feeling, most shy, most clever in concealing its depth. For beauty of all sorts, great manliness and love of sports, a grave, wise thoughtfulness and truth, a merry fun outlasting youth, a courage terrible to see, and mercy for his enemy. He had a clean shaved face, but kept a hedge of whisker neatly clipped, a narrow strip or picture frame. Old Daw, the woodman, did the same, under his chin from ear to ear, but now the resting hounds gave cheer, joyful and arrogant and catch him smelt the glad news and ran to snatch him. The master's dogcart turned the bend. Damsel and Skylark knew their friend. A thrill ran through the pack like fire and little whimpers ran in choir. The horses cocked and pawed and wickered. Young Cothill's chaser kicked and bickered and stood on end and struck out sparks, joyful and catch him sang like larks. There was the master in the trap clutching old Roman in his lap, old Roman, crazy for his brothers, and putting frenzy in the others, to set them at the dogcart wheels, with thrusting heads and little squeals. The master put old Roman by, and eyed the thrusters heedfully. He called a few pet hounds and fed three special friends with scraps of bread, then peeled his wraps, climbed down and strode through all those clamorers in the road, saluted friends, looked round the crowd, saw Haridu's three girls and bowed, then took White Rabbit from the groom. He was Sir Peter Bind, of Coombe. Past sixty now, though hardy still, a living picture of Goodwill, an old, grave soldier, sweet and kind, a courtier with a knightly mind, who felt whatever thing he thought. His face was scarred, for he had fought five wars for us. Within his face courage and power had their place, rough energy, decision, force. He smiled about him from his horse. He had a welcome and salute for all, on horse or wheel or foot, whatever kind of life each followed. His tanned, drawn cheeks looked old and hollowed, but still his bright blue eyes were young, and when the pack crashed into tongue, and staunch white rabbit shook like fire, he sent him at it like a flyer, and lived with hounds while horses could them lying in the ghost heath wood. Sir Peter, said an earth stopper, old Baldy Hill, you'll find em there. Z I come to cross I smell em plain, there's one up back, down Tuttox drain, but, Lord, it's just a bog, the Tuttox, hounds would be swallowed to the buttocks. Heath would, Sir Peter's best to draw. Sir Peter gave two minutes law for Kingston Challow and his daughter, he said, they're late. We'll start the slaughter, ghost Heath, then, Dancy. We'll be going. Now. At his word, the tide was flowing. Off went Maroon. Off went the hounds. Down road. Then off. To Chull's Elm grounds. Across soft turf with dead leaves cleaving and hillocks that the mole was heaving. Mild going to those trotting feet. After the scarlet coats the meat came clopping up the grass in spate. They poached the trickle at the gate. Their horses' feet sucked at the mud. Excitement in the horse's blood. Cocked forward every ear and eye. They quivered as the hounds went by. They trembled when they first trod grass. They would not let another pass. They scattered wide up Chull's Elm Hill. The wind was westerly but still. The sky a high fair weather cloud. Like meadow's ridge and furrow plowed. Just glinting sun but scarcely moving. Blackbirds and thrushes thought of loving. Catkins were out. The day seemed tense it was so still. At every fence cow parsley pushed its thin green fern. White violet leaves showed at the burn. Young Cottle let his chaser go round Chull's elm field a turn or so to soothe his edge. The riders went chatting and laughing and content in groups of two or three together. The hounds, a flock of shaking feather, bobbed on ahead, past Chull's elm cop. The horse's shoes went clip a clop along the stony cart track there, 
The little spinney was all bare. But in the earth moist winter day, the scarlet coats twixt tree and spray, the glistening horses pressing on, the brown faced lads, Bill, Dick, and John, and all the hurry to arrive, were beautiful like. Spring alive, the hounds melted away with master, the tanned lads ran, the field rode faster, the chatter joggled in the throats of riders bumping by like boats. We really ought to hunt a by day. Fine day for scent, a fly or die day. They chopped a bagman in the check, he had a collar round his neck. Old Ridden's girl's a pretty flapper. That Vaughn's a cad, the whippersnapper. I tell, ee, -e, lads, I seed, em plane down in the rough at Shifford's main. Old squire stamping like a duke. So red with blood I thought he'd puke in apoplexy, as they do. Miss Jane stood just as white as dew and heard him out in just white heat, and then she trimmed him down a treat. About Miss Lou it was, or Carrie, she'd be a pretty peach to marry. Her'll draw up wind, so us'll go down by the firs, we'll see em so. Look, there they go, lad. There they went, across the brook and up the bent, past Primrose Wood, past Brady Ride, along Ghost Heath to cover side. The bobbing scarlet, trotting pack, turf scatters tossed behind each back, some horses blowing with a whinny, a jam of horses in the spinney, close to the ride gate, leather straining, saddles all creaking, men complaining, chaffing each other as they passed, on Ghost Heath turf they trotted fast. Now as they neared the Ghost Heath wood some riders grumbled, what's the good? It's shot all day and poached all night. We shall draw blank and lose the light, and lose the scent and lose the day. Why can't he draw hope? Gone away, or Tuttock's wood, instead of this? There's no fox here, there never is. But as he trotted up to cover Robin was watching to discover what chance there was, and many a token told him that though no hound had spoken, most of them stirred to something there. The old hound's muzzles searched the air. Thin ghosts of scents were in their teeth from foxes which had crossed the heath not very many hours before. We'll find, he said, I'll bet, a score. Along ghost heath they trotted well. The hoof cuts made the bruised earth smell. The shaken brambles scattered drops. Stray pheasants cuckered out of cops, cracking the twigs down with their knockings and planing out of sight with cockings. A scut or two lopped white to bramble. And, now they gathered to the gamble at ghost heath wood on ghost heath down. The hounds went crackling through the brown dry stalks of bracken killed by frost. The wood stood silent in its host of halted trees all winter bare. The boughs, like veins that sucked the air, stretched tense, the last leaf scarcely stirred. There came no song from any bird. The darkness of the wood stood. Still waiting for fate on Ghost Heath Hill. The whips crept to the sides to view. The master gave the nod, and, Lou, blew in. Ed Hoik, Ed Hoik. Lou in, went Robin, cracking through the wind and through the hedge gap into cover. The binders crashed as hounds went over, and cock 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 the pheasants rose. Then up went stern and down went nose, and Robin's cheerful tenor. Cried, through hazel scrub and stub and ride. Oh, wind him. Beauties, push him out. Yui, on to him. Ya hout, ya hout. Oh, push him out. Yui, wind him, wind him. The beauties burst the scrub to find him. They nosed the warren's clipped green lawn, the bramble and the broom were drawn. The covert's northern end was blank. They turned to draw along the bank through thicker, cover than the rough, through three and four year understuff where Robin's forearm screened his eyes. Yui, find him, beauties, came his cries. Hark, hark to daffodil. The laughter fallen from his horn, brought whimpers after, for ends of sense were everywhere. He said, This hope's a likely lair, and there's his billets, gray and furred. And George, he's moving, there's a bird, asterisk a blue uneasy jay was chacking, a swearing screech, like tearing sacking, from tree to tree, as in pursuit, he said, That's it. There's fox afoot, and there, they're feathering, there she speaks. Good daffodil, good terry breeks, hark there to daffodil, hark, hark. The mild horn's note, 
the soft flaked spark of music fell on that rank scent. From heart to wild, heart magic went. The whimpering quivered, quavered, rose. Daffodil has it. There she goes. Oh, hark to her. With wild high crying from frantic hearts the hounds went flying to Daffodil, for that rank taint. A waft of it came warm but faint in Robin's mouth, and faded so. First find a fox, then let him go, cried Robin Daw. For any sake ring, Charlie, till you're fit to break. He cheered his beauties like a lover, and charged beside them into cover.